Wow, this is a freaking unbelievable crowd. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for coming out early on a Friday morning. And uh, thank you, John and, and uh, Creative Mornings, for having me. Uh, as John mentioned, I'm a senior investigative reporter at Vice News. And uh, Vice News is part of Vice Media. We're uh, a global media company. Uh, Vice News is about two years old. And uh, I cover national security. Uh, which encompasses terrorism, civil liberties, uh, virtually everything these days could be uh, construed as national uh, security. And that means that everything I do, everything I write about, uh, is about taking risks. And uh, this is actually the perfect topic uh, for me because my entire life has been about taking risks. Uh, and. Uh, up until 10 years ago with, uh, without the regard of how it would impact me, uh, the subjects I wrote about or uh, uh, you know, what, what the fallout would be. So I, I think that I'm uh, in a unique position to discuss risk, uh, particularly you know, as it relates to uh, journalism. Uh, I, I mean, I even, you know, I, I'm the guy that when it, you know, the, the traffic light turns yellow, I'm like, I think I can make it. Uh, so that's... I'm the risk taker, and uh, uh, but it's it, you know it's it, f thinking about risk. It's uh, you know it's interesting uh, that you know since uh, since John mentioned Karl Rove, I think that's a, a a good place to start. And I'm sure everyone remembers or knows who Karl Rove is. He was uh, Bush's brain, turd blossom. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, let me just kind of go back and, and sort of discuss that context, the context in which he referred to me as a nut with internet access in his book. Uh, I had been covering uh, for, uh, uh, for quite some time the leak of covert CIA operative Valerie Plame. Uh, do you guys remember the Valerie Plame uh, uh, scandal, the leak? Uh, it revolved around her husband writing an op-ed about, uh, you know, lying, uh, 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 the Bush administration lying us into the Iraq war. And this was a, a, a huge uh, uh, breach in when, when her identity was leaked. And so I spent a number of years covering this, uh, covering this story for uh, a different news outlet, a uh, number of different news outlets. And during the course of my coverage, I had uh, cultivated some amazing sources. Uh, and these sources were you know, sources within the FBI, within the Department of Justice. And during the time I was reporting this, um, I had these were anonymous sources. So the sources that I you know, had been citing in all of my reports just would not go on the record. So right there, you know, that was a risk, okay? But it was the type of risk at the time that I was taking that I didn't think about. I didn't think about, well, what would happen to me, to my credibility, <clears throat> if I were to report a story uh, that perhaps it could be wrong? Uh, you know, as a journalist, where we're, uh, and, and I could, you know, I'll speak for myself, I was so sort of driven uh, by, the, you know, by the scoop, uh, by landing a scoop, by, uh, uh, scooping my competitors at the New York Times, at the Washington Post. So for a number of years, I had just you know, reported a series of stories uh, about what happened behind the scenes. Then it, it, you know, fast forward to a Saturday afternoon. Uh, I'm driving in, uh, driving in the valley, uh, taking a car into uh, you know, a repair shop, and I get a call from a source. And this source said to me, uh, Carl Rove had been indicted last night, was secretly indicted uh, for uh, his role in the Valerie Plame scandal. Uh, he has uh, 24 business hours to get his affairs in order. Uh, you have to go out and report the story. So 
it didn't even occur to me at that time that one, you know, perhaps, and this was a source that I had been working with, working with for a while, but it didn't even occur to me that there was a possibility that maybe this isn't true. Uh, and I completely trusted my source on that. And uh, I made a couple of phone calls, and mind you, this is a Saturday. Uh, I wanted to be the first one out with this story. So uh, I, I went back to my office, and I quickly wrote it up. And not even thinking uh, you know, about the risk that I was taking uh, in reporting this. What would the, you know, what, wh how would this impact me? How would this impact my news organization? How would this obviously impact Karl Rove? Uh, you know, I was just driven by, you know, being first. Uh, so I reported the story. Uh, as we know, Karl Rove was never indicted, and it was completely wrong. And that was really my, f my first understanding of what, it was, what, it, what it's like to take gr uh, you know, a, a serious risk and, and going out there on a limb. And I remember watching, you know, uh, after, I re after I filed this story, uh, I remember just kind of watching online, seeing the reaction. And I just sat back and said, oh, I, I wonder how long it will be before the New York Times and the Washington Post report this. Um, and uh, and I, I had, I was, it was just great. I was like, ah, oh, I can't wait. This is going to be awesome. And then two days went by, and there was nothing. And I'm like, oh, shit. Uh, you know, th th that was serious. And so Carl Rove and his camp, uh, they went out and destroyed me. Uh, this, it, it, that was the other thing, is that I went up against Carl Rove. <laughs> um, what was I thinking there? You know, so it... it it was really a, an incredibly hard lesson, uh, and uh, it destroyed my credibility. That was 10 years ago. That was uh, June of 2006. Um, it also was around the time that I released uh, a book called News Junkie. Uh, it was a, it's a memoir that I wrote, and uh, if you want to read um, the extended version of risk-taking, it's all in there. Uh, it kind of mixes, you know, the personal and professional. But, you know, that was, uh, that was my first uh, understanding, my first uh, entry into the world of, uh, of, you know, thinking about how risk, you know, can impact me, can impact, you know, family, uh, my family, I and, and in my news organization. And, and you know, their, their goal, Carl Rove's goal, the, the government's goal at that time was to drive me out of business. I mean, just make sure that I never, ever write again uh, and report again. And uh, uh, it almost worked, but I refused to, to go down. Uh, and, and it brought me into this, you know, to this whole other world. Um, so one of the things that I do now um, is, uh, it, you know, just, just fast forwarding a bit, I use the Freedom of Information Act. Let me just tell you about the Freedom of Information Act. It's a law that's going to be 50 years old this summer. It allows journalists and anyone in the world to ask the government for its documents, for documents on, a, on anything. They don't have to give it to you, uh, but uh, you have the, you know, the right to ask for documents. And, I, and I've asked for everything. I've asked for, I've asked for emails from the, the, the director of the NSA, and surprisingly, they gave it to me. Um, and, you know, I've asked for the uh, the memo that author that the uh, that the uh, Obama administration cites uh, that allows them to uh, uh, kill a U.S. citizen abroad, the uh, targeted killing memorandum. So, you know, I I I looked at this as an opportunity to um, restore my credibility uh, at right after this Karl Rove uh, scandal. And I'll tell you the uh, you know the the you know the the entry into that where I realized that. Uh, this was such a, an, inc an incredibly powerful tool. And uh, I had been speaking with a source who said that he received some documents from the Air Force uh, that showed that the nuclear missile officers, these are, uh, these are the airmen who literally turned the key and would be in control of our, our, of our nukes. And they have to take ethics uh, training. 
you know, the ethics and morals of launching nuclear weapons. Well, he handed me these documents that he obtained through the Freedom of Information Act, and they were PowerPoint slides. And these PowerPoint slides showed that the Air Force cited Jesus Christ and a former Nazi SS soldier to, uh, they stood them up as the, uh, as the, as sort of the morals uh, and ethics of launching nuclear weapons. Essentially saying Jesus would launch nukes if he could. Uh, and this Nazi SS uh, soldier who, who happened to be also the father of the modern day space program, he was a good guy and he would do it as well. And I looked at these documents and I was like, this is unbelievable. Um, is this actually true? And again, I'm thinking, you know, I'm really cautious at this point. You know, I mean, I, I've been scared straight. You know, that, that, that incident with, with Karl Rove um, really just scared the shit out of me. So I wanted to make sure that like, you know, that if I was gonna take a risk and write a story that said Jesus Christ would uh, launch nuclear weapons and the Air Force is teaching this, that uh, I would be correct. So, uh, you know, checking, I checked it out and sure enough, you know, this, this ethics training had been in place for two decades. And it was true. And they were actually teaching them that, you know, there, there were pictures, there was a, like weird pictures of Jesus on a horse and Jesus, you know, as if he were launching nuclear weapons. So I went out and I, and I reported the story. I made, you know, made some phone calls. I, I, I vetted it. And that was a risk. And I was worried. I was like, oh man, what's going to happen? Are, are other journalists going to believe this? Are they going to just look at it? Oh, Jason Leopold's reporting this. And oh my God, look at him. So I went out, I reported it, and then I put the documents up. Um, and these documents kind of, you know, spoke for, it spoke for itself. The documents uh, uh, just, you know, were, were, were its own sort of justification that this was, you know, this was taking place. And I was blown away by the response. So the story went viral uh, and it, uh, it, it just took off. Within 24 hours, the Air Force um, canceled its ethics training. So, so uh, after being in place for two decades, so this was incredible impact, and it and it reminded me, or or it educated me on, you know, the rewards that come from taking certain risks, and you know the uh, the, the the thing that I learned at that point was that. You know, as I mentioned, I was really driven by, you know, by sc the scoop, landing a scoop, um, the speed at which, you know, uh, to, to report a story. This was one where I just went really slow. There was no need to, you know, to, to go fast, to, to jump on it. Um, and that's been an important lesson. And after I, you know, after I uh, reported the story, I said to myself, I want more. I want more documents. I need to file Freedom of Information Act requests with, you know, with every government agency. Uh, and I did. Uh, I, you know, I have about uh, a thousand Freedom of Information Act, you know, rec uh, requests outstanding. I have uh, about two dozen lawsuits against the government. Um, the government has called me a FOIA terrorist. Uh, the FBI has referred to me that way. They, you know, basically saying that I'm terrorizing them with all my requests. Uh, you know, this, this behind you here, um, this also like sort of uh, was, was, you know, at a time when we started learning more uh, about the, uh, about how journalists and uh, the, the way in which we report our stories, um, how the government would scrutinize it. So, you know, part of the risk taking I, I take now and other uh, 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 national security reporters um, take, uh, I mean, it, essentially this would have sounded like a conspiracy many, many years ago. But the reality is, is that when you are reporting on government programs or classified programs, issues related to national security, um, we're taking risk. We're taking a risk that one, our sources will be investigated and prosecuted, uh, that we will be investigated and prosecuted. I mean, I, again, this is real. Uh, the Justice Department has secretly obtained reporters' phone records. So, uh, you know, the way in which we, con we, we conduct ourselves and we, and we perform our, our tasks are, um, 
you know, we, we have to be very careful uh, because uh, the, you know, there is a risk re reward there, but the downside is, is that uh, it, it, could, it could also, um, you know, have grave implications for the sources and the people who we depend upon. Uh, so after I started filing these Freedom of Information Act requests, uh, that's when I realized that I landed on the government's radar and they're not very happy with me. And so what this is, um, I don't know if we can get to the document on it or if it'll just sh slide it, but I had uh, I've been writing about Guantanamo and the CIA's torture program. I've done extensive work on that. And, and uh, while I was investigating the uh, first high-value detainee captured after 9-11, the detainee who became the guinea pig for the CIA's torture program, uh, the first one who was waterboarded, his name is, uh, goes by the name of Abu Zubaydah. Uh, I had been, you know, uh, I had done a Google search, a deep Google search, I think I was on page 90, uh, and uh, I landed on this story where there was a comment on the story, and this story was like, I think, 2009, and the comment was left two years later. And the comment said, do you think it's fair that, my that, that I was jailed in Oregon for the crimes of my brother? And I was like, what? What, what is that about? Um, and I looked, and there was another comment, and it, it occurred to me, I'm like, does this guy who's in Guantanamo, who was the guinea pig for the torture program, does he have a brother here in the United States? And you know, I, I found this comment, I, I started researching, and sure enough, he did, and nobody knew about it. And this was uh, such a, an amazing find because the one who was in Guantanamo, we didn't know anything about him, nothing. We only knew what the government told us. And I wanted to write a profile about him, uh, and finding out that he had a brother who lived in the United States was a huge score. So uh, I uh, contacted him, I found that he was now living in Florida, I traveled to, uh, to meet up with him, and you know, we spent a few days together. He then signed over a privacy waiver to me. And the privacy waiver means that, uh, uh, well, well, let me just back up for a minute. When I met up with him, I found out that he had a far better story than, you know, than, than his brother, that uh, after 9-11, the FBI uh, turned him into an informant to go into mosques uh, around the Portland area and spy on Muslims uh, with the promise that they would give him a green card. Uh, so this was an amazing story, and it turned out that I wanted to write a story about him. So he signed over a privacy waiver, and this privacy waiver essentially says, I give you, government, the, uh, uh, the authority to turn everything you have on me uh, over to, uh, to Jason, to me. And so I filed this request, and uh, you know, three months go by, and, and normally when you file requests on, on, under the Freedom of Information Act, it takes a long time for the government to respond, which is why I sue them a lot. So uh, to, to get them to hurry up, get me to the top of the pile there. So you know, I filed this request, and then I get a phone call one day, and it was from, the, uh, fr from this guy's wife, he said, J uh, she said, Jason, the, the FBI is here. I'm like, oh, what's going on? She's like, well, they're asking about you. And I'm like, what? They're like, yeah. She's like, yeah, they're, they're asking about your Freedom of Information Act request. And they're interrogating Hisham, uh, her husband, and they want to know what he told you. So I was like, holy shit, you're, you're kidding me. Uh, so I called the FBI and was very irate with them don't investigate me. And they're like, ah, ha, ha, click, you know. <laughs> uh, so I, I said, I'm going to file a Freedom of Information Act request about this particular day. And I want you to give, uh, I follow with the FBI, and I said, I want you to give everything, give me everything that you have on me about this particular day. Um, three months goes by, and I get a set of documents, three pages, and it's, it's these documents. And it basically says, you know, there I am, mixed in with, with you know, this, this alleged terrorist in Guantanamo, and there's a mention in there of Osama bin Laden. Um, so it's like Leopold, Osama bin Laden, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, holy shit. Uh, and this was stunning. This was, this was frightening. This was chilling. You know, this, this was, 
you know, unprecedented, really. Basically, the government went out, sent a special, F uh, special agent from the FBI out to investigate my source and to um, interrogate him about what he told me and what I was working on. And that, you know, I, I realized that when I would be reporting this story, I would be taking, you know, a huge risk. And I won't lie, I was paranoid. <laughs> so I was constantly looking in my rear view mirror. There was one time when I was driving on Sunset um, that suddenly, like, my car just stopped. And I got out and I looked underneath and literally, like, all the fluid was coming out of, like, some line or something. And I was like, oh, my God, they're, you know, they're after me. <laughs> um, but this was, th this was, you know, a... Uh, um, by the way, I don't believe that anymore. Uh, so I just want to make sure that you guys know that. But, it, you know, th it, again, this was a, 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 an example of the type th of work that I'm doing now. The government has such a great interest in keeping secret that I need to slow down and understand that anything I do from this point forward is, you know, is taking a risk, but it also comes with as I said, great reward. And it's really balancing the two, okay? Um, one thing that I do now, uh, the reason I use the Freedom of Information Act as often as I do, uh, is because, one, I don't want to use anonymous sources anymore, and I don't. As I, as I mentioned, that episode with Carl Rove was, I'm done with that. Um, and then I use the Freedom of Information Act, and the reason I do that, because when I, as, a, as a reporter covering national security, uh, there's nothing really good when you're writing about national security. It's not like, hey, there's this great government program, and um, they're getting all your emails. Isn't that cool? You know? So it, it's, it's essentially writing about the, the, the lengths at to which the government is going uh, to violate privacy, civil liberties, in the name of national security. So, uh, you know, this, this uh, you know, th th these are issues right now that, um, that affect everyone. So, uh, so I wanted to make sure that, you know, that I'm not using anonymous sources. And then on top of that, because under this administration that, that there has been an unprecedented, uh, you know, that, that uh, 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 unprecedented extent to which the government has gone to uh, to prosecute whistleblowers, leakers. Uh, I found that my, my job, you know, doing this job has been incredibly challenging and difficult. And uh, essentially, uh, that means that uh, nobody that I, you know, my sources are unwilling to speak with me because there's no upside for them. They would be taking a risk. And if I were to report what they had told me, they worry that they would be investigated or perhaps prosecuted. So I have to figure out how, how am I going to do this job? How am I going to, you know, continue, to, you know, to report here? And uh, that's, that's when I, you know, started turning to uh, the, the Freedom of Information Act. And, uh, you know, so the Freedom of Information Act, is, as, as I mentioned, has proven to be you know, a very, very powerful tool. Uh, going on to, I don't know, if, I'm sure everyone's heard about the Hillary Clinton email thing, right? You know that thing? Uh, so that's another sort of uh, example of, um, of risk. And, and, and let me explain why. So back in November of 2014, when it became very clear to me that... Uh, Oh no, are they coming? Are they coming? Um, let that pass for a minute. Uh, <laughs> whoa! So, <laughs> freaky, right? Uh, sorry. So back in November of 2014, when it became clear that Hillary Clinton was going to be the, the uh, Democratic presidential uh, nominee, or excuse me, you know, that she was going to run for the... Uh, uh, as the uh, uh, Democratic presidential candidate, I filed a Freedom of Information Act request with the State Department. And I said to the State Department, I, give me all your emails on Hillary Clinton uh, and your memos and anything else you got back there. Uh, and the reason I did that, and this just, just to give you some context here, 
Uh, this was about, say, four or five months before uh, the revelation surfaced that Hillary Clinton had been using a private email server. So I had no idea at this time that that even you know, was an issue. I asked for these documents because I wanted to inform the public. Okay? The Freedom of Information Act is, is such a, a, a great nonpartisan tool uh, because ev anything I ask for, um, I, I'm essentially trying to provide the public with information that they would otherwise not receive. So I asked for, th for these emails because I thought it would be incredibly important to provide the public with information about the Secretary of State and how she performed her job and how that may, you know, help inform uh, uh, the public's decisions and, you know, who they wanted to vote for. Uh, and and ha perhaps how she would perform as president. So I asked I asked for these uh, emails, and I knew, you know, having covered, uh, you know, the the last presidential election, um, that I would be taking a risk here, and 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 it's a different type of risk. Uh, the risk here would be that the public would interpret what I was doing um, as trying to you know, help someone else get elected. Uh, I, I was often accused of, you know, when I was uh, being critical, or my, my stories appear to be critical of, of the Obama administration when he was running uh, in the last presidential campaign against Mitt Romney, of trying to help get Mitt Romney elected. It was very odd. Journalism has become so, you know, looked at as such a, par as so partisan. And I truly feel, you know, and believe that I'm, you know, nonpartisan in the sense that I just want to report the news, and I don't, I don't take a position. You know, perhaps I will write about you know, torture being wrong, uh, because it is, but I don't think that there is like, oh, well, here's the other side, and it says it's great. You know? So uh, people interpret that as having a liberal bias, if I were to you know, report that. So I, I you know, filed this Freedom of Information Act request, and then I sued the government, sued the State Department, and then, they, then the, uh, uh, the scandal surfaced on uh, Hillary Clinton. And uh, the, it turned out that you know, my case was you know, in, the, uh, uh, in U.S. District Court in Washington, right when, the, you know, right when this scandal surfaced. And so a judge basically you know, forced the State Department to turn over all of her emails to me on a monthly basis. And, and um, needless to say, Hillary Clinton's folks are really unhappy with me right now. Um, but also the public, again, they think that, you know, my pursuit of these documents is partisan. You know, and that's a, that's a risk. I, I, I'm at, you know, I, 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 you know, either that I'm for Bernie, I'm against Hillary, that I'm trying to get Trump elected. So um, it's, again, I, I want to emphasize that I simply wanted to provide the public with information that they would not have otherwise had. You know, uh, and this was a re really important, uh, you know, there's a lot at stake here. And so I knew that by doing this, you know, it would be, um, it would be taking a risk. And it would be taking a risk in the sense that I'm now under scrutiny again, right? Just like the, the presidential candidates are. So anytime I write a story, uh, you know, they're, they're going to be, uh, particularly on this issue of the emails, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton's camp would be, you know, looking at it very closely and perhaps even using some things from my past as a way to sort of discredit me. That was, um, that was uh, again, another sort of hard lesson, uh, you know, to learn, but one that comes with great rewards because, you know, the, the emails, I, I ha like I said, I had no idea that there was, uh, that there was a private email server. Uh, and, you know, we helped push this out. We helped open government. Uh, and, you know, that, that's one of the things that, that, you know, that I do over at Vice News is, you know, pushing the government to be more transparent. Uh, you know, it's, it's a risk that has great rewards. And, uh, you know, I move a, a very slowly these days and, and I'm very meticulous in, in terms of, you know, what I go after. Um, you know, one of, one of the other uh, things I want to touch on is uh, 
I do a lot of work on the CIA. And this is, uh, this is a story I recently reported. I don't know if anyone um, recalls, but uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, while the Senate was working on their report, voluminous report about the CIA's torture program, uh, there were allegations that the CIA had spied on the Senate while they were preparing this. And this led to a near constitutional crisis. Uh, and everything was, uh, was secret. Uh, it was very difficult to find out what was going on behind the scenes. So once again, you know, looked at the Freedom of Information Act as my way of trying to get answers. And uh, I uh, sued the CIA after they refused to give me what I asked for. Can you believe that? You know, uh, and uh, you know, about six, seven months after the lawsuit was filed, the CIA turned over, you know, a, a pile of documents. And these were unbelievable documents. These were documents that shed enormous light on what went on behind the scenes while the Senate was working on uh, a incredibly important report about one of the darkest chapters in US history. And it showed that, in fact, the CIA was trying to uh, thwart the Senate's attempts at oversight, and they were, in fact, spying on them. And there was this incredible document in this cache that I received, and it was an apology letter that the director of the CIA sent to, uh, or excuse me, it was an apology letter that the director of the CIA wrote to Senator Dianne Feinstein, who was the chairwoman uh, of the Senate Intelligence Committee and the ranking Republican member, basically saying, I'm sorry we spied on you, we won't do it again. <laughs> and I've never seen this letter before. And uh, I contacted Dianne Feinstein, and her staff rather, and they said, um, we never got that letter. And then I contacted the CIA, and the CIA said, we mistakenly turned that over to you. Um, <laughs> and please don't post it. <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh. Um, and again, then my head started going back to 10 years ago, and I'm like, oh my god, I got to post this tomorrow. You know? So this was, um, this was incredible, because it really showed that, you know, uh, th th this letter became sort of the lead. You know, that was like, thank you, CIA, for telling me this because now I was struggling. What should the lead of my story be? And, you know, I just found it. But I knew that, you know, that it, posting this letter um, would really anchor the CIA. And basically, there was no national security issue here. This was simply an agency that was embarrassed that, you know, that, that the director, you know, wrote a, uh, wrote a letter that he never sent, apologizing for um, uh, something that you know nearly led to a constitutional crisis, and so you know I needed to talk this over with you know with my editor, and you know we we sort of balance what what's the risk reward here, and the risk is is that um, you know the, the CIA would try to go out and discredit me. Uh, and, and that's something that I've actually seen in documents that I've obtained um, about other reporters uh, and how you know, government, uh, certain government uh, officials will you know, go to certain reporters at other publications and kind of talk shit about them. Um, in fact, I got some documents from the Justice Department where they're talking shit about me and they're saying, oh, can you believe Jason Leopold is you know, terrorizing us? And then they're saying that I should join, you know, they, they say uh, that in, in these documents, in these emails, I mean, then they go on and on, and I'm just like, wow, I can't believe they're, you know, they're doing this, but they're talking about how I should form a band and call it FOIA Posse, and they're like, oh, that would be a cool band name. Um, really weird, you know, what your taxpayer dollars are, you know, are going toward. So um, anyway, I reported this story. Uh, knowing that it's going to anger the CIA. There was no national security you know, risk here. Uh, that there was nothing that was going to damage national security. And uh, yes, it did anger the CIA. And uh, you know, for me, one of the reasons I work here in Los Angeles, I work in our office in Venice, uh, is because I want to be removed from sort of that access you know, that uh, my colleagues in New York or, or D.C. have 
when it comes to the beltway, when it comes to sources. Um, it keeps me competitive. I know that you know just by being removed, uh, I you know can can sort of think a little bit more clearly as a, as opposed to you know the CIA you know saying to me you know don't publish this. Um, you know if I were in D.C., they may actually you know hey come out to dinner with us and we want to talk to you. You know it, I I need to sort of have that distance. So uh, you know kind of to just circle back, you know, the past 10 years have been incredible. Um, and as a, as a journalist, it's, it's really, you know, important uh, to, you know, for, for you guys to understand the risks that we take. Um, and, I, and I'll just, you know, end on this is that, you know, at Vice, um, you know, there's a lot written about Vice. The journalists that, that I work with take enormous risks. They are incredibly passionate about journalism and about providing you with information, um, information that you need to know about. One of our journalists was recently um, jailed in Turkey uh, for, for quite some time. Uh, we've had uh, some of our journalists who have been kidnapped uh, and you know, held hostage. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's a frightening time to be a journalist. Uh, and uh, you know, at the same time, there's, you know, you know, we, as I mentioned, you know, balance that with the incredible rewards that come with, you know, providing the public with, uh, with important information. So, uh, thank you.